Fantastic. Like I said, we're in the book of Ephesians. We're kicking off. And, um, and it's a great book. It really is a great book. It's a, a letter, New Testament letter, written by Paul the Apostle. Uh, it's one of his prison letters. Paul wrote a few letters while in prison to a few churches, and this is one of them. He's writing to the churches in a city called Ephesus. Now, Ephesus uh, was a big city. It was a grand city. It was a great city, much like the city of Pretoria. Ephesus was a commercial city. It was booming. If you wanted to make it in life, they would say, you need to end up in Ephesus. And so Paul writes this letter to a group of churches in that city wanting to encourage them, wanting to remind them of God's beautiful truth, that we are loved more than we could ever imagine because of what has been accomplished by Jesus on the cross. Now, what we tend to do here at Rooted Fellowship is we literally walk verse by verse through books. That's what we tend to do. And that's what I want to do as we make our way through the book of Ephesians. But I'm going to do it slightly different this time. We're still going to walk through verses, right, verse by verse, but we're going to jump around from chapter to chapter, and it'll make sense as we walk through this book. And so my hope is that you would continue to come and continue to join us so that the entire book would make sense as a whole. And so this morning, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1, but we're going to start at verse 15, right? We're going to start at verse 15. Remember, I said to you that Paul is the author. He's writing to a group of churches in a city called Ephesus. He's writing to the elders who are then called to go and teach this to their congregations. And he starts by saying, hey, guys, I want to let you guys know that if you are in Christ, if you are a Christian, if you've crossed the line of faith, that you have received every spiritual blessing from heaven. Every single one is yours. That you already possess it. And then he literally goes in and unpacks each spiritual blessing. And, and we'll get to that. I don't want to skip it. I'm not, I'm not going like to just disregard it. We'll get to it. We're going to come back to it when we cover Ephesians chapter 2. What I want you to know here is that he lists out every single spiritual blessing. There's five of them. He says to the church in Ephesus, he says to us that because of what Jesus has accomplished, he, you are chosen. You are redeemed. You are included, you have an inheritance, and you are sealed. And all of this, all of this is beautiful. It's beautiful news. In fact, Paul is so blown away by this revelation that, that in the original text, in the actual Greek, verses 3 to 14 is actually one long sentence with no punctuations. It's like he started writing and literally could not lift his hand from the paper because he was so blown away by what we have received in Christ, every spiritual blessing. But when he finally does put the pen down, he goes, all I'm left to do now is pray, is to offer up words of worship, to pray for myself and to pray for you. I'm so blown away by what I've received, I just want to pray. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to look at Paul's first prayer in the book of Ephesians. Paul prays twice here in this book. We'll cover the second prayer a little bit later, but this is his first one. After being blown away by what we have received in Christ, he goes, I'm just going to stop and I'm going to offer up words of worship. And so I'm going to ask you to stand as I read this prayer. Um, if you're able, I would ask that you stand. And, and here's why. We stand for a number of reasons, right? Uh, when we're at sports games and we're excited or when uh, the, the team is coming out, we stand in honor of them or we stand at a wedding when the bride comes in. So we stand for a number of reasons. I also believe we should stand for the reading of God's word to honor him because these words change lives. And so I'm going to read it and then I'm going to pray and then we'll get to work. Hear these words of our Father. This is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, the glorious Father. For many of us, that doesn't make sense. 
Because the Father that we know is nowhere close to glorious. And yet here, Paul is saying that if you are in Christ, God is not just your Father, but He's the glorious Father. The glorious Father would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what is the wealth of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe, according to the mighty working of His strength. He exercised this power in Christ by raising Him from the dead and seating Him at the right hand in the heavens far above every ruler, authority, power, and dominion, every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fulfills all things in every way. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. We thank you that these ancient words are still very much alive today that they transform our hearts and so god would you meet us where we are this morning as we open up the book of ephesians as we look at paul's first prayer make it real to us lord it's to that end that i ask that you stand in my body think through my mind speak through my vocal cords those things you'd have us know say and do may the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight god you are our king you are our redeemer you have your way in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Paul prays. He prays recognizing what Christ's death and resurrection secures for him. This compels him to pray. And he prays for wisdom so that the people might see for themselves the richness of being in Christ, the, a richness that outweighs any earthly wealth or prosperity. And this is why I want to take a look at this prayer. Verse 15 says, This is why, since I've heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, your faith and your love, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. You see, knowing Christ is one of the New Testament ways of describing saving faith. Jesus Himself, in His high priestly prayer, John 17, says this, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ prays that we would know him those who know Christ have eternal life and those who don't know him are without it but but what does knowing Christ encompass I'm glad you asked knowing Christ involves more than just facts and information about Christ it involves more than just facts and information about Christ. Let me give you an example. I, I think I know quite a bit about Oliver Reginald Tumble. I know where he was born. I know where he went to school. I know about his early out adulthood. I know his desires and ambitions before joining the anti-apartheid struggle. I know some of his weaknesses and strengths. I've read many of his writings and speeches. But here's the thing. I don't know Oliver Tumble. The facts are helpful, but they are not enough. See, knowing Christ involves more than a passing acquaintance. See, to truly know someone is, is to have mutual knowledge, that there is mutual exchange. That's what it means to, to know someone. And here Paul prays that we would know Christ. See, tragically, I believe that there are many religious people who believe that they are Christians but yet don't know Christ. Even in this very room. I know that. This is why Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter 7. He says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many, Jesus says. Not a few, not some. He says here, many, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. F friends, I, I want you to, to hear the warning here. What Jesus is saying is, is, is that there's, there's many, there's many who, who, who know facts about me and, and who have read some of the things I've said, but they do not have a relationship with me. Some of us, we, we treat the kingdom of God as if we are consult consultants being hired by God. Before I uh, got into all of this, I used to work for a few corporates and we did a lot of consulting work. We'd be hired by the company and then we'd show up to give our, our expertise, our, our expert advice and expert skills. Sometimes we'd be there for a couple of days. Sometimes we'd be there for weeks. We'd show up and be with the employees, with the company. I'd get to know the people there, the receptionist, the lady on the second floor, the CEO. I'd get to know all these people. But I was not part of that company. You see, I was... I was familiar but I was not family I was familiar but I was not family and there is a massive difference and many of us run the danger of being familiar with Jesus but we are not family and this is why Jesus warns us he warns us and so the question must be asked do we really know Christ Are we in him? Does he know us? 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3 says this, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. And so are you known by God? Is there an, an intimate exchange between him and us? Or do you just show up to things? show up to a Sunday gathering, show up to your family group with no relationship to Jesus. Remember, Paul is writing to the church. He says these things, but he's writing to the church. He said, guys, I want you to know Christ. And you'd think, but no, hold on. I, we're the church. Surely we know Christ. Oh, no, no. There's some of you that are missing it. Paul wants the Ephesians, Paul wants us to know Christ, to know him better. Paul wants us to have a deeper, more comprehensive knowledge of Jesus, which is dripping with intimacy. That's the difference. Intimacy. Into me, see. Jesus, I want you to see into me, but I also want to see into you. And so he prays for knowledge. But before we move on, it's important for us to take note that Paul prays for the Holy Spirit to do this work. The spirit of wisdom and revelation, he says. That we cannot know Jesus without the Spirit revealing him to us. This is the importance of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 to 12 says this. Now, God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit. Since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except his spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have not received the Spirit of the, the world, but the Spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. We need the Spirit, friends. I say this often, right? I say it often, and, and I know some of you are probably tired of hearing this, but I have to. I have to repeat it because we are forgetful people. It is not God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Scriptures. Now, the Scriptures are 
importance because they reveal to us the Son who points us to the Father by the power of who? The Holy Spirit. And so we need the Holy Spirit to reveal to us who Jesus is. Paul knows this. And then he makes it known to us. We need the Spirit as we ask for better knowledge of Christ. But after doing this, Paul then moves on to request from God for us a better spiritual vision. A better spiritual vision. Look at me, it says here in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. We've just sung this. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I pray that the eyes of of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the mighty work, working of his strength. Three things Paul prays for. For hope, for wealth, and for power. For hope, for wealth, and for power. Firstly, let's look at hope. Paul wants us to have a better vision of the hope of his calling. The hope of his calling. Now you might ask, what is the hope of his calling? I'm glad you asked. We find that in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10. In fact, we should read verse 9 for context. I love the fact that scripture unpacks scripture. Scripture interprets scripture. And so you're sitting here going, what is the hope of his calling? Ephesians 1 Verse 9 says this, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure that He purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time. Watch this. To bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in Him. We, we could sum up all of Ephesians with these two verses. That the, that the book of Ephesians is telling us that, that everything, everything, God's desire, God's plan is to have everything united in Christ. This is one of the reasons that I love the book of Ephesians. See, all the other letters, they're great and they're amazing, but all the other letters, Paul is addressing particular issues. It's like things have come up in those places and, and have made it to Paul's ears. And so Paul goes, I need to address this. And so he tackles certain issues. But here in the book of Ephesians, it's almost like we see there's different categories here. Not one thing, but different categories. And he's saying, guys, all of them are summed up in the fact that in Jesus, all things will be united. We see it in, in, in us being reconciled to the Father. Ephesians 2. We see the implication of that, of us being reconciled to one another. We then see that in the context of the church. We then see that in marriage. We see that in family. We see that in the workplace. That is, he's going, guys, there's this cosmic brokenness that divides us. And because of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross, all things are now being united to him. And then Paul wraps up the book of Ephesians by talking about spiritual armor, which is super weird if you're reading the book of Ephesians. It's almost like, whoa, what is this about? You're talking about all these great things that we, we, we by the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to be unified in. And then you go, hey, now I need to put on some armor. What? Well, it's because if we are going to be obedient to the Father and, and seek to be unified as we are unified to Christ, expect conflict. Expect the one who loves division to come at you, to come at your marriage, to come at your family, to come into the church, to come in the workplace where you live, work, and play. And so he's saying, while you're being united here, there's an enemy who wants division. So you better put on that armor. That's the whole plan. The grand narrative of the book of Ephesians is to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. The hope of his calling. And our calling is tied to his calling. Hence Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. And so you cannot separate his calling to our calling. You just can't. 
See, many of us, we run around going, I don't know what it is that God's called me to. Well, the problem is that you haven't started with His calling. That's where you need to begin. That's where the church needs to begin, to understand the hope of His calling. Because our hope has its source in His hope which took place before the creation of the world, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. It is sealed in us by the Holy Spirit, given to us that one day we will stand in glory with Jesus Christ. There's so many beautiful scriptures that testify of this. Romans 8, the Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, that alone, friends, blows my mind co-heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him Colossians 3 4 when Christ who is your life appears then you also will appear with him in glory Paul prays that we would take hold of this colossal hope take hold of it but what what is hope maybe we're sitting here and we're like oh no this sounds great but what is hope Oxford Dictionary says this, hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. A feeling of expectation and desire. Hope is the opposite of despair. Hope breathes massive optimism. And we as the people of God should be the most hopeful. Even in a broken world, because we know that we're going to stand with Christ on that final day when he returns to make all things new again. And in that moment, we will look just like him, completely whole and without sin. We long for that day. Gospel hope is living in the tension of the already but not yet. It's living in the tension of the already but not yet. We'll see later in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we are standing with Christ in this very moment right now you are with Christ but you recognize that, that that's, that's not my positional standing that's not where I am like right now it's the already but not yet gospel hope allows us to live in that tension it was the great African theologian saying Augustine African theologian from modern day Algeria he says this Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain as they are. That's gospel hope. To look into a broken world and to go, this is not how it ought to be. To look at the divorce rate and to go, this is not how marriage ought to be. To look at broken families and to say, this is not God's intention for family. I'm frustrated. And I also have courage to step into those broken places with the truth of the gospel, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, this is why the church, when everyone is running away because they are disgusted, they are frustrated, they cannot handle the brokenness, the church runs in because we have gospel hope. And so our prayer should be, Lord, would you continue to reveal to us the hope of your calling? Just as Paul prayed, we pray the same. Reveal to us the hope of your calling. That's the first thing that Paul prays for. The second one is for wealth. Not the kind of wealth that you're thinking. Stay with me. Paul prays that our eyes will be opened to the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints. What he wants us to see is that we are God's treasure. That we are God's treasure. Uh, Peter puts it this way in his first letter, chapter 2, verse 9. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a what? A people for his possession. That we belong to God. We are his treasure. Scottish biblical scholar F.F. F. Bruce says this. I love it. He says, Paul prays here that his readers will appreciate the value which God places on them. He's planned to accomplish his eternal purpose through them as the first fruits of the reconciled universe of the future in order that their lives may be in keeping with the high calling and that they may accept 
in grateful humility the grace and the glory thus lavished on them. We see this in Ephesians 3 where we're told that it's through the church God's manifold wisdom is being declared to the heavenly. Guys, he chose us to do that. He chose you. You, of all people, you, you. We are his treasure. God owns all the earth and all the heavens and everything in between it, but it is us who are his treasure. We marvel at the universe. We marvel at the stars. We marvel at so many different things, failing to see that God looks to us and he says, you are my treasure because of what Jesus has accomplished. We should be blown away by this truth. Paul prays that we would see this with our heart's eyes because it will change how you view yourself. Why is this important? Because it changes how you view yourself, that no matter what others may say about you, you can stand and go, no, 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 that's not true because here's what God says about me. Some of us are carrying the, the, the words of, of, of family members and, and, and friends and society and culture. And we're holding on to those as if they're true. We should be digging in God's word and saying, God, what are you saying about us? What are you saying about us? In Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, we are the children of our glorious Father the children of our glorious Father, that you have a seat at the table. And so Paul wants us to know that the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, hope, wealth, the last one is power. It's a big one. Power. Here Paul outdoes himself as he stacks synonym on top of synonym on top of synonym in his attempt to describe the power of God. We've read verse 19, but, but let's read it and, and let me show you some of these Greek synonyms. You can put that up on the screen. Next slide. He says this, and what is the immeasurable greatness, megathos, where we get the word magnitude of his power, dynamis, which is where we get dynamite, toward us who believe, according to the mighty, the kratos, which is dominion, working energia, this is the energy of his strength, ischus, which is the strength. Guys, he's stacking synonym on top of synonym, on top of synonym, on top of synonym, to say, guys, this is how powerful God is. Paul has layered these synonyms to express as best as he can the highest power possible. He exhausted his language to communicate the power of God. And then, and then he gives us an illustration. He gives us an analogy, if you will, to help us further understand this power. He says in verse 20, he exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. See, Paul wants us to see that the power that raised Jesus from the dead can be in our lives. Can be in our lives. This amazing power changes us from, from being children of darkness, which we'll see in Ephesians 2, to children of light. And it gives us practical victory over sin in our lives. It transforms us to become more and more like Christ. And it gives us His influence in this world so that we might see change in it. That's the power that dwells in us. And one day, for those who are in Christ, we will see it visibly in the resurrection of our own bodies, of our own bodies. Now, I know that might be a drag to some of y'all because you were thinking, I'm getting an upgraded body. You are. You are, six packs on all. I hope. But your body will be resurrected we will visibly see that power. There is no created power in the universe that, that can do that except the power of God. And yet we are told that this same power is operating in and for us. In and for us. For those who believe right now. Right now. Some of us, we, we, we look to the heavens wondering, 
is it coming? Is it coming? Is it coming? Failing to recognize that it's here right now. Seated in here. Think about that for a moment. In this building, this brick and mortar, dwells the very power of God for those who believe. And so Paul, I believe, would ask the question, are you experiencing that power? Rooted Fellowship, are we experiencing that power? Do you see it? I want to talk about that in a moment. What I want to say here is that I find it interesting that Paul uses the power of the resurrection to talk about the power of God. Let's, guys, slow down a little bit because I think we read too quickly through God's word and we miss some of the golden nuggets. We, we, we go to the verses that we're familiar with, that we love, that we can put on a coffee mug, print on a t-shirt, great verses. But, but, but we do that failing to recognize the golden nuggets that are here. Why does Paul use the power of the resurrection to talk about the power of God? Look, Paul could have gone to multiple places. The power of God displayed in Jesus as he walks on water. The power of God displayed in Jesus as he calms the storm. The power of God displayed in Jesus as he raises Lazarus from the dead, as he feeds the 5,000. He could have gone to any of those places because they're epic and they're amazing. But he goes to the resurrection. He chooses the resurrection. Which made me ask the question, where did the power of the resurrection begin? Now, look, some of y'all might sit here and go, oh no, it's always been there, which is correct, because it's the power of God, and God is always present. And if he's always present, he's always powerful. But in light of the resurrection, because Paul here chooses the resurrection, where did the resurrection begin? If we're tracking the life of Jesus... Maybe we're, we're walking through the life of Jesus like we would maybe uh, as we watch a movie. We realize that there, that there are certain segments of a movie, certain chapters of a movie. And they're communicating something to us. Where does the power of the resurrection begin? I believe it begins in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the life of Jesus, the, the power of the resurrection begins in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. And so I want us to read that. To read it in the book of Luke, Luke's account. I believe it'll be up on the screen as well. Remember, we're trying to figure out why, why Paul would use the power of the resurrection to show us that the power of God that was in Jesus dwells in us. Luke chapter 22. From verse 39, it says this, He went out and made his way as usual to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. This is Jesus. When he reached the place, he told them, Pray that you may not fall into temptation. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and began to pray. Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. This, this is Jesus. Remember, he's fully man, fully God, but fully man. And, and, and it's in his humanity, he's realizing what is in front of him. What lays ahead. His death and resurrection. And so he prays. But he is filled with anguish. Other gospels tell us that he began to sweat blood. Which is a real thing. Modern medicine tells us that, that you can be so anxious and so full of anguish that, that, that you begin to sweat tears of blood. Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Father, if there's another way. That's, that's what it's saying. Father, if there's another way, because I recognize what lies ahead. If there is another way, could you hook me up? But notice what he says. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He doesn't even wait for God to answer. 
Verse, friends, verse 42 screams obedience. That's what's happening here. Father, if there's another way, but you know what? That your will be done. I'm going to be obedient to whatever it is that you have called me to, regardless of what lies ahead. It screams obedience. Obedience over comfort. Obedience over comfort. Because many of us, that's what we want in situations like this. You know what? This is not comfortable for me. This is uncomfortable, God. God, what you have planned for me is uncomfortable. I don't want to go there. I don't want to be a part of this. I don't want to experience this. But do we have enough faith to say, not my will, but your will be done? And then look at verse 43. What does it say? Then an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Strengthening him. Oh no, what are you trying to say? I believe the Bible is telling us that obedience activates the power of God in our lives. Obedience activates the power of God in our lives. Let me maybe explain it this way. Um, I've gotten the opportunity to go to some pretty fancy places, right? And I've done that with my wife, which has been epic. And these places are incredible. Beautiful architecture, beautiful technology. It's grand. And some of these places at night, what they have uh, is a, a beautiful pathway with beautiful gardens to make your way to wherever it is that you're going. But to save electricity, what they do is they install motion sensor lights. So that as we walk, the lights pick up on us and now we can go where we need to go. That power is always there. Always. But it's the motion that activates that power that allows the light to be revealed. Obedience activates the power of God. Guys, we see it here. He, he, he's going, okay, here's what lies ahead. The resurrection, the death and resurrection. Oh, it's insane. It's intense. God, if there's another way, you know what? I'm going to choose to be obedient over comfort. And then we're told an angel from the Lord came and strengthened him. And guys, this strength, this power continued right through until his resurrection. If we continue to read the book of Luke, we see that this power was present when he was arrested. Judas shows up to arrest Jesus. What does Peter do? Whips out a sword. Like, I don't know. It's one of two things. It's either he was just swinging everywhere and got lucky and chopped off one of the guy's ears, or Peter is like a samurai ninja of the Middle East. Precision. Knew exactly what he was doing. It's one of, those, one or two of those things. But you know what? Jesus goes, no, hold on. That's, that's not the power that I'm here to demonstrate. Picks up the ear, puts it back on the guy's head. This power continues when he's brought before the people and they ridicule him and they mock him. The power to stand and go, it's, it's okay. I know who I am. I know who I belong to. This power continues when he faces the Sanhedrin and they question him. This power continues when he stands before Pilate who doesn't really know what to do with him and so sends him to Herod. Herod then just kind of continues to make jokes about him. You know what? This power in verse 9 of Luke 23 says this. So he kept asking him questions, but Jesus did not answer him. Some of us need the power just to keep quiet. We need heavenly power just to keep quiet. Because too often we want to defend ourselves and say, and I'm not against that, guys. I'm not against it. But there are times where you just need to sit still and be like, you know what, this is not even worth my time. God's in control. I'm standing in his power. That power continued when he was sent back to Pilate. And Pilate was like, okay, let me figure out a plan. Uh, let me put Barabbas here and you, surely they will choose you over this murderous man. And yet they don't. And Jesus just stands. In fact, in John's account of his conversation with Pilate, Pilate says to him, you know what, I, I have authority, I have power to let you go. Jesus says, the only power you possess is the power that has been given to you. 
You have wealth and resources and money. And, and it's, it's like J- Jesus puts his hand. He doesn't, right? I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it. He, but it's like he puts his hand on Pilate and, and he says, and you believe this gives you power over me? I have a different power. This power continues as he carries the cross on his way to being crucified. And who shows up? We're told Simon from Cyrene. He's, Jesus still has that power that, that enables him to receive help from someone else who God has empowered. And then the power continues all the way to his crucifixion. It's the power to forgive. It's the power to grant access to the kingdom of God. That's the, guys, that's the power that dwells in us. We're told that he exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead, seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler, authority, power, and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet, appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Power. But let, me, let me try to make this practical. I'm going to close with this. I want to give you some practical implications that I believe are relevant for our community today that speak of this power that is experienced through the obedience of God's people. Paul prays here and he gives us a very powerful illustration for a reason because he's saying, guys, I'm I'm witnessing you guys as the church, your faith, your love, it's epic, but you're missing out on the power of God. And here's some practical ways that the power of God is evident in our lives. Scripture tells us, firstly, that this power enables us to face our inner hurts and fears. There's fear and hurt in this room. And we carry that fear and that hurt with us everywhere we go. So many people are locked into hopelessness, which leads to inefficiency because they dwell in the pain and the hurts of their lives. Failing to recognize that the power of God liberates us from those. It liberates us from our disappointments, from people and circumstances. It liberates us from from the dysfunctions of our bad past. It liberates us from all the skeletons in our closets, all the generational curses tucked away under our beds. We covered this last year. It gives us true freedom. The power of God can give us true freedom, that that we no longer have have to to sit side by side with sin. So many of us, we've become become buddy-buddy with our sin because we find greater comfort with our sin than we do with God. I'm sure many of you have heard of the Stockholm Syndrome. It's crazy, go Google it. It's about these people in Stockholm it was a bank robbery that ended up turning into a hostage kind of situation. And, and so the bank robbers st- uh, spent some time with the hostages in that bank for a couple of days and they built a relationship and it got super weird. It got to a point where the hostages, when finally released and now were, they were prosecuting these robbers, they wouldn't give them up because they had established a relationship with their hostage takers. Many of us are dealing with Stockholm Syndrome. We spend so much time with the sin in our lives that we become buddy-buddy with it. The Israelites experienced this, being liberated from Egypt, yet would still call on the things of Egypt. You're liberated from Egypt, but you're still calling on the things of of Egypt. So much so that when Moses came to, to, to meet with Pharaoh for the first time and he said, you need to let my people go. That's what God is saying. Pharaoh was like, mm-mm, makes it harder for the Israelites. The Israelites begin to complain. They're complaining at their liberator. We've become so comfortable with our sin. But the power of God frees us from it. Secondly, the power of God is the power to abandon evil, sinful habits like drunkenness and addiction, an evil temper, a lustful practice, bad decisions. The power of God allows us to say no to those things. 
No, in the name of Jesus. The power of God can restore broken relationships, can reconcile enemies. It's the power to grant forgiveness and to receive forgiveness is the power to heal. The power of God allows us to reach out to others, to help and serve. It's the power to respond to people's hurts around you. The power to take some of your time, talents, and treasure and to love others with them. This is what makes the church function as God's intended missionary tool to the world. It's the power of God that allows us to be ambassadors of the kingdom of God. And some of us need to experience that. We really do. Some of us are holding on to sin in our lives because we believe the lie that, that we, we, we need it. It's like a crutch in our lives. To be liberated, but also to be free. To be liberated and to be free requires the power of God. Broken relationships. Friends, I don't have to say much about that. We live in a context where much of our history comes from there. Broken relationships that need to be reconciled. The power of God does that. I love the South African Constitution. I think it's great. But the Constitution of this country cannot transform the hearts of people. It tells us how we are to li live, but it assumes, it assumes that our hearts have been transformed. It assumes that, that we have received forgiveness and that we have given forgiveness, and, and it assumes too much. This is why the church steps in and goes, South African government, great document, some issues here and there, but great document. Um, we'll take over from here. It's the power of God. The power of God to reach out and to love our neighbors. And so we start the book of Ephesians this way. We start by looking at Paul's prayer and saying, okay, if we're going to tackle these issues in this book, God, we need a deeper, more comprehensive knowledge of you that leads to intimacy. And then we need the eyes of our hearts to be open to the hope of your calling, the wealth, of the glorious inheritance of the saints, and the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead but now dwells in us. And so friends, my prayer for us is that the eyes of our hearts may be open. We've sung it. I pray that we believe it. Open the eyes of our heart so that we might be able to say with Paul in Ephesians 3, verse 20 to 21, now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Did you hear that? Makes me wonder if some of us are asking for too little. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And so, Father God, that is our prayer this morning. That we stand with Paul the Apostle, asking, Holy Spirit, that you would do a work that only you can do. That it is you, Holy Spirit, who reveals reveals the Father to us through the Son. And so, Lord, would you soften hearts this morning? Some of our hearts have been hurt. Some of our hearts are angry or scared or frustrated. Lord, would you give comfort and peace and grace where it's needed? God, would you also give conviction? Some of our hearts are lazy. Some of our hearts choose disobedience or selfish constantly looking for excuses you bring conviction and truth the gospel does both it presents to us the truth and then it covers us with grace and so would you do that in this place Jesus shine your light in the areas of darkness Lord I pray that we would be honest that we would be open that we would be vulnerable that we would be transparent that we would stop hiding 
so that we might be able to sing worthy. Worthy are you, Lord. You're worthy to be praised. It's in your beautiful name we pray.